the title of my talk is uh, Can There Be Autochthonous Methods of Constitutional Interpretation? And I want to stress the method the, that I'm interested in, methodology of interpretation, rather than substantive interpretation. Um, I have to begin by saying I'm not a specialist in European constitutional interpretation, and indeed, uh, I lack any of the needed languages. Um, so I can't say anything about what um, European populist uh, or constitutional interpretation in specifically European, specifically populist regimes uh, is. But I was struck in the, in, in the description of the program by the geographical limitation, or at least the implicit geographical limitation, or at least the possibility that the geographical identification has some analytic significance. Um, uh, the latter point is that referring to European pop interpretation in European populist regime suggests that constitutional interpretation in such, such regimes might be different from uh, constitutional interpretation elsewhere. And my topic is uh, how might such differences manifest themselves uh, if they exist? Um, on reading drafts of some of the papers submitted for this uh, conference, um, I, I should note that um, I, there, there are some suggestions in, as I read the papers, about whether there is a distinctive uh, forms of interpretation um, in European populist regimes. And if I have time, uh, I will uh, address them uh, at the conclusion of my remarks. So to begin, I emphasize again, my, my concern is with uh, methods of constitutional interpretation. And those have to be distinguished, that topic has to be distinguished from obviously, I think, substantive constitutional uh, provisions and more problematically, perhaps, interpretations of substantive provisions. Uh, now, we all know that substantive provisions vary among nations. Uh, some nations guarantee social and economic rights extensively, others don't. Some nations protect a wide range of such rights, others a smaller set. Some nations protect free expression generally. Uh, others provide specific protection for artistic expression. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, although not always, uh, the choices of substantive provisions reflect specific national experiences. So, for example, the South African Constitution has an extremely detailed provision on the procedures for pretrial detention. Uh, and it's clear the reason for that is that uh, the prior experience in South Africa with pretrial detention generated uh, an interest in the drafters in really tying down and limiting uh, the power of governments uh, to engage in pretrial detention. Uh, and there's a more general uh, uh, account of at least some constitutional provisions that constitutional dra drafters should uh, focus on or at least pay attention to the specific national problems that they anticipate arising uh, after the Constitution is adopted uh, and address those problems in their constitutions. Um, uh, I'm currently working on a project that involves um, elect regulation of elections. Uh, and the form of election regulation will sometimes depend on whether you expect your government after it's established to be a dominant party government, a multi-party coalitional government, or you know, a more or less standard small, party, small number of parties uh, competitive system. Uh, now, substantive revisions of the sort that I've just described are responsive to particular national concerns and are in that sense autochthonous. But I actually don't think there's much analytically interesting about the autochthony of these things. It's just, you know, they are nationally specific. Uh, what about interpretations of what seem to be identical substantive provisions? These two vary, uh, although uh, 
the case here is complicated by questions both of uh, translation uh, and contextual uh, understanding. So I'm going to use an example of uh, constitutional protection of privacy, individual privacy. Uh, we know that constitutions adopting such a revision, using exactly the same terms, whether in a common language, English in the United States and its subnational co constitutions, France and France and Francophone Africa, or in translations that all agree are linguistically identical, can be interpreted uh, to reach different results in different nations. And so they, again, you can have, in some sense, autochthonist interpretations of substantive revisions. Um, uh, the reason is pretty straightforward. I'll use the doctrine of proportionality uh, as my uh, vehicle, but other examples uh, could be uh, used. Um, suppose you get to the stage of proportionality analysis where you're dealing with uh, proportionality as such. Um, again, a footnote here, the same kind of argument can be made at prior stages of, of, of the uh, proportionality analysis. Just a little easier to do it uh, in this setting. So under proportionality as such, a statute promoting some social goal will be unconstitutionally disproportionate if its intrusion on the constitutionally protected value, privacy, is not justified by the extent to which it advances the social goal. Okay, that's straightforward. Uh, the degree to which privacy is valued, though, varies from nation to nation. Uh, so a statute might be unconstitutionally disproportionate in a nation that places a high constitutional value on personal privacy, but constitutionally proportionate in a nation that, while recognizing a constitutional right to individual privacy, places a small, smaller weight on it, uh, enough smaller that the balance will uh, shift uh, with respect to whether the statute advances the social goal enough to uh, outweigh uh, the intrusion on privacy. Now, national, political, and social cultures will determine the weight to give, given to at least some constitutional values. Uh, and so, for that reason, there can be substantive constitutional interpretations of identical provisions. Um, uh, now, we might qualify um, that conclusion by challenging, challenging the premise that the substantive revisions are identical, although actually I think when you work through the analysis, which I, I think I'll, I'll skip here, um, uh, saying that the provisions, although they look identical, are actually different, just reduces the problem to the, or the issue to the prior one of nations having different substantive uh, provisions. Um, so uh, uh, I, the, the general uh, proposition uh, is that uh, context matters uh, within a single language or across translated provisions. Um, so uh, I, in the United States, the Alaskan Supreme Court has interpreted its provision, its constitutional provision on searches and seizures, which is in the same English terms, terms in the English language, as the U.S. Constitution's provision is. The Alaskan Supreme Court has interpreted those, those words uh, to be more restrictive of police practices than the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted the very same words. Um, and I think the explanation, uh, standard explanation, is that Alaskans see themselves as uh, the inheritors of a tradition of rugged frontier individualism. Um, we might say that the historical conditions of Alaskan constitutionalism give the word privacy a distinctive meaning different from the word's meaning in the continental United States. Uh, but that, as I say, just reduces the problem to the prior one. Either the substantive revisions are autochthonous, privacy index to Alaska or and privacy index to the rest of the United States or the interpretations of the provisions uh, are autochthonous. So with that underbrush out of the way, I want to turn to my primary topic, which is uh, whether there can be, again, autochthonous methods uh, 
of constitutional interpretation. Um, now, as, as Sultan mentioned, constitutional theorists in the US and elsewhere have developed lists of interpretive methods, originalism with many variants, traditionalism, living constitutionalism, in Canada, living tree interpretation, interpretation with re reference to universal moral and political truths, uh, and more. Um, uh, um, for the United States, uh, Philip Bobbitt has identified one, what he calls modalities of constitutional interpretation uh, that is especially important in the present context. Um, Bobbitt calls this modality, I think somewhat misleadingly, uh, ethical, by which he means not with reference to universal moral uh, or philosophical principles, but rather interpretation with reference to what is described as a nation's ethos or normative self-understanding. Um, the core message of an ethical interpretation in ethos, in, in, in Bobbitt's terms, is that's simply not who we are as a people. Or you know, conversely, this is who we are as a people. Now, this modality is important because it rules out one obvious possibility for autochthonous interpretive methods, interpretation in light of the distinctive characters of the nation's people. That is, that kind of interpretation done in Ireland, say, is just the same mode of interpretation as is done in, in my version, Alaska, about rugged individualism. So, for example, the preamble to Ireland's 1937 constitution makes explicit reference to that nation's specific national history and the religious composition of its then people. Uh, and interpreting uh, a constitutional provision, a guarantee that the state will not deprive people of life or liberty without due process of law, in light of the Irish preamble, might lead to Ireland-specific results, um, as it did with respect to abortion until the Constitution was amended, uh, but would deploy the ethical modality uh, of interpretation, not an Ireland-specific one. Um, and I think that's true also with more general or other um, identitarian interpretations. Uh, such as, as I understand it, uh, um, has occurred with respect to the uh, um, Hungarian constitution uh, since 2011, or uh, with respect to the uh, German constitution's uh, preservation of German identity within uh, the European Union. These are, again, these are nation-specific, but they are illustrations of the general, again, in uh, Bobbitt's terms, uh, ethical modality of interpretation. Now, as I've noted, uh, Bobbitt's terms, term ethical is misleading uh, because it might be confused with the, another modality of interpretation, which we can call philosophical. Constitutional provisions are to be interpreted uh, with reference to the best available philosophical understanding uh, of the concepts identified uh, by their terms. This is I, my version of Dworkin's uh, uh, approach. People will, of course, disagree about what that understanding might be. And it might even be the case that the disagreement will map systematically onto geography. Uh, we might find a, that a survey would show that a majority of jurists in Western Europe understand equality in one way, while a majority from Southeast Asia uh, understand it differently. But again, the philosophical modality of interpretation is universal rather than autochthonous, just as Bobbitt's ethical modality is. The, the, the outcomes might differ, but the modality of interpretation is the same everywhere. Uh, so far then, uh, we don't have an account uh, in which there can be autochthonous modalities of constitutional interpretation. But uh, Bobbitt's work provides the basis for such an account, although it's messy and complicated, and I don't really want to commit myself firmly to it. What Bobbitt argues uh, is that in the United States, the list of interpretive modalities available at any moment in time uh, is limited. 
Now, that possibility, I think, does open up the possibility of truly autochthonous interpretive methods. I, I'm now going to use much more formal language than I would uh, like to do. Uh, but so consider the possibility that examining all the interpretive modalities we find in the world leads us to develop a set of modalities consisting of n elements, some number of elements. If each nation uses only a subset of that set, if, for example, the US doesn't use living tree interpretation, and if each nation's subset differs from every other nation's, or perhaps if the sets fall into families, as the European grouping uh, suggests, with each family different from the others, we might describe alternative interpretive methods as autochthonous. The nation has a distinctive approach to constitutional interpretation, and we might uh, then seek such an explanation for why this nation chooses one subset of interpretive methods uh, and that nation chooses another. Now, that conclusion might be made even more plausible, I think, if we supplement Bobbitt's analysis with a related one offered by Richard Fallon. Uh, according to Fallon, who is a US <laughs> scholar uh, focused on the US, uh, US interpretive methods um, include, uh, methodology rather, rank the interpretive uh, modalities with originalism as the first, others following. Uh, the possibility of ranking makes it even more plausible uh, that nations would differ in interpretive methods. So just to use a US-Canadian uh, uh, comparison, uh, uh, the US approach might say, follow the original understanding unless doing so would have disastrous contemporary effects. And the Canadian approach might be, uh, choose the interpretation that best fits contemporary conditions uh, unless that interpretation is flatly inconsistent with the semantic meaning of uh, relevant constitutional provisions. Uh, and again, uh, we might seek explanations in national experience for the different approaches. Now, note that this argument depends on the assumption that the modalities available within a nation are limited to a subset of all possible modalities. Now, of course, it's going to be true that within any temporal period, whether short or long, we will find only some modalities uh, uh, deployed. Um, that might occur, though, only because the need for using a new or different modality hasn't yet arisen. Uh, a truly autochthonous uh, interpretation isn't possible if interpretation everywhere can draw any element from the set of possible modalities as needed. Though it will always appear that uh, when closely analyzed, uh, every nation's interpretive method is autochthonous. So here's the point I've reached. Uh, Bobbitt claims that the modalities available within the United States are limited. If so, the US has an autochthonous method of constitutional interpretation. Unless there's some reason to think that the US is special with respect in this uh, regard, um, uh, so uh, conceivably uh, would every other nation. Um, the question then is, are the modalities of interpretation in the US and probably elsewhere actually limited? Now, imagine that a, this is actually the, the example I'm going to give is actually based on um, some some arguments made in the early 1940s in the US. Imagine a US lawyer uh, makes an argument that the US Constitution properly interpreted uh, protects a defendant's right to engage in some practice mandated by her religion because, and this is the key point, a specific Bible verse uh, clearly indicates that secular authorities uh, lack the power to prohibit the practice. Other lawyers, and I think all judges, would reply that whatever its merits as an interpretation of the Bible, the argument was not a legal argument. Um, uh, you might contrast this with an argument made to an Egyptian court uh, 
that some constitutional interpretation was correct because it was supported by Quranic verses uh, in light of the uh, provision in Egypt's constitution that in one translation reads, the principles of Islamic sh Sharia are the main source of legislation. That would be a legal argument. So again, this religion-based argument today is not legal in the US, but would be legal uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt. Theology is an available modality of interpretation in Egypt, but not, but not in the United States. Now, the reason is not that the two nations constitutions themselves identify all the modalities of interpretation. Uh, nothing in the US constitution, or uh, I have here, this may be wrong, uh, Anna Gamper apparently is going to talk about this uh, later. Uh, most other national constitutions, nothing in the US Constitution, I know, uh, prescribes how the document is to be interpreted. Uh, originalism in the United States and living tree interpretation in Canada are imposed on the documents from the outside, so to speak. So now, rather, uh, the, the, the reason for the availability and unavailability of modalities of interpretation uh, lies in national legal culture. And national legal culture is the way, uh, product of the way lawyers are educated and socialized. At any specific moment, lawyers will recognize some arguments as legal, <coughs> others as not legal. And that recognition will vary from nation to nation. And so again, at any particular moment, national methods of constitutional interpretation will indeed be autochthonous. Uh, we can examine legal education and socialization in specific nations to explain why some arguments are accepted as legal and others are not. Uh, and as before, um, national legal cultures are not set in stone. Uh, innovations in uh, legal education including contact between lawyers and legal educators working in different traditions, uh, can induce uh, gradual changes in national legal cultures. So my conclusion is that there might be distinctive national methods of uh, constitutional interpretation. Or to turn to the conference title, constitutional interpretation in European populist regimes might be distinctive. And not in terms of substantive uh, interpretations of specific constitutional provisions. Uh, that, of course, might be so. But in terms of the methods of constitutional interpretation that are uh, deployed, such distinctions would have to be rooted in distinctions among national legal cultures. And national legal cultures ch can change, but they change slowly, uh, which suggests to me that um, uh, if we're thinking about the development of a European populist mode of constitutional interpretation with European populism um, developing over the past decade, uh, there may not have been time enough for there to be uh, a change in the national legal culture, in which case you wouldn't see uh, distinctive uh, uh, modes of uh, European populist uh, constitutional interpretation. Um, uh, now, I, I should say I'm skeptical about the possibility that n relevant distinctions exist among such cultures, at least again, as I've suggested now. Uh, and, and, and so I'm skeptical about possible claims that there is a special way of interpreting constitutions in European populist regimes. And here I, I have a few minutes. So I want to speculate on some uh, thoughts, or I want to offer some thoughts based upon my reading of some of the papers that were uh, circulated already. Um, my take on the ones that I read is that many of the authors uh, are arguing that the modes of interpretation in European populist regimes are in fact not distinctive. Um, they are, um, in my terms, continuous with the modes of interpretation that uh, existed prior to the development of European uh, uh, populism. Uh, now, my speculation, and this is um, notes made 
like this morning rather than the result of some serious uh, uh, thinking about it, is that there are issues of both legal and political significance that arise in connection with the claim of continuity. Uh, with re Again, I'm not a specialist in the area, so these are very speculative. With respect to political uh, uh, significance, I, I, my, I don't know, my speculation is that emphasizing the continuity of contemporary populist interpretations with prior modes of interpretation um, opens up the possibility of the reversibility of these uh, contemporary interpretations. They can be seen as, uh, that one, one, the authors hope, they might be seen in a decade as temporary aberrations from the ordinary course of interpretation in the nations. Uh, the legal significance is I'm le even more speculative about. Um, uh, these, the concern seems to be something like, uh, are we observing constitutional continuity or constitutional rupture? Uh, and if it's con both continuity and rupture are somehow, in my mind, related to questions about whether the populist regimes uh, represent or are the product of exercises of the constituent power of the people or rather are ordinary exercises of, call it in this context, uh, constituted power within the framework of ordinary uh, politics. Um, I myself am not at all clear what the significance of the distinction between, uh, yes, the constituent power was exercised, and no, it wasn't, what the significance of that is. But I have a sense that there's something about that that's going on in these discussions. OK, uh, with that, I will conclude. And, and I, I look forward to uh, conversations over the next couple of days that will uh, help me understand better uh, the kinds of ideas that I've articulated and, and, and uh, uh, will help me modify them uh, and qualify them uh, appropriately. Thank you. Thank you.